Hello, my name is Nolan Hildebrand and my presentation is entitled Developing a Phenomenological Approach to Analysis of Performances of Open Graphic Scores. In this presentation, I will outline my phenomenological approach to open graphic score analysis through a case study in the form of my ongoing open graphic score research project. For my open graphic score research project, I work with performers to interpret and perform my open graphic scores, followed by a discussion on how the gestures and sounds in their performances correspond to the score. Performers' subjective non sonorous preceptive and affective responses to open graphic scores is the ideal starting point for analysis because it contextualizes the intuitiveness or semantic soundness of the graphic notation. The performances will further will be further explored and analyzed with aspects of Lassa Thorson's oral synology system to create a visual analysis. My two main research questions are, how does discussing performance phenomenological experiences with open graphic scores in post-performance help us to better understand the ambiguous relationship between score and sound? And can more complex open graphic scores retain a perceptible oral identity over subsequent performances? A brief introduction to phenomenology. So in the 20th century, phenomenology came into prominence in the writings of Husserl, Heidegger, Sartier, Marleau-Ponty, Deleuze, and others. David Smith states that phenomenology is the study of structures and consciousness as experienced from the first person point of view. The central structure of an experience is its intentionality. It's being directed towards something as it is an experience of or about something. Uh, although phenomenology in and music have a rich history. Phenomenological based musical analysis is a relatively new area of research. Because it is not within the scope of this presentation to give an extensive history of phenomenology, I will offer four basic guidelines for phenomenological investigation given by Eric Christensen. The first of these guidelines is to suspend natural belief. Husserl used the Greek word epoch to describe the act of suspending natural belief in order to observe the world in an unbiased way. To allow one to achieve a more precise experience of the world. In contemporary phenomenology, the term to describe the suspension of natural belief is bracketing. Bracketing is an essential step in assuming the phenomenological attitude, which is our second guideline, adopting the phenomenological attitude. And Husserl conceives of this attitude as the opposite of the natural attitude, which is centered around the belief that we are the subject among the objective world. The phenomenological attitude abstains from adhering to the general hypothesis of the existence of all objects of the world as some sort of natural reality. Thirdly, include the, the life world as a prerequisite for phenomenological investigation. Christensen notes that despite the call for, for suspension of presuppositions, an absolutely pure experience is not possible. This is because the individual's socio-cultural context is the basis for pre-understanding and experience and description can never completely be segregated from the life world. And lastly, regard the body as the origin and enduring basis for phenomenological investigation. Because consciousness cannot be separated from the body, the physical body must be taken into consideration when developing a phenomenological investigation. As Merleau Ponty states, quote, our own body is in the world as the heart is in the organism. It keeps the visible spectacle constantly alive. It breathes life into it and sustains it inwardly and with it forms a system. In his writings, Deleuze focuses on sensation, precepts, and affects. Deleuze believes that art creates a block of sensation, that is to say, a compound of precepts and affects. In Logic and Sensation, when discussing Francis Bacon's paintings, Deleuze states that music must render non-sonorous forces sonorous the way that painting must render invisible forces visible. Russell Ford believes that by sensation, Deleuze aims to conceptualize an aesthetic dimension that is coextensive but distinguishable from perception, and states that each art takes as its aim the reversal of the occlusion of sensation by perception. This means that each art struggles to render what is denied to its particular medium by perception. Thus, music aims to make the non-sonorous sonorous. In this presentation, I'll be focusing on the phenomenological music analysis of Judy Lockhead and Lassa Thorson. In her phenomenological analysis of Wolfgang Rimm's Am Horizont, Lockhead relates the Deleuzian idea of rendering non-sonorous forces sonorous to Don Ide's idea of making mute objects sonorous. Lockhead utilizes Ide's idea to express a phenomenological attitude by building on her own sense as one of many possible hearings of the piece. 
Lockhead's focus on her emotional affects towards the musical performance is extremely useful and relevant to my project. However, rather than discuss my own emotional affects, affective responses to performances of open graphic scores, I look to the emotional phenomenological experiences of the performer as the starting point for analysis. While Lockhead and Thorson utilize the physiological aspects of the body through music as heard, Lockhead takes a more overt approach by looking to Deleuze's concept of sense to engage with the body as the unitary place of sensation and discusses how the music causes her listening body to be aesthetically transformed. Over the last two decades, Lassa Thorson has created an extremely comprehensive taxonomy of terms and graphic tools for musical analysis called aural synology. Thorson's system enables the transcription of sound qualities based on Pierre Schiffer's pioneering work by focusing on lis the listener analyzer perspective of music as heard as the starting point for sonic and structural analysis of musical performances. A central concern of the aural sonology project is the development of aural consciousness through a systematic application of different ways of listening, beginning with Pierre Schaeffer's reduced listening. Lindsay Vickery and Cat Hope note that one important factor contributing to the efficacy of notation is semantic soundness, the degree to which the graphical representation makes intuitive sense to the reader rather than necessitating learning and memorization of new symbols. Mark Applebaum also somewhat unintentionally illustrates how discussing the interpretation process with performers post-performance can illustrate the complex relationship between score and sound. In a documentary on his open graphics score, The Metaphysics of Notation, a performer tells Applebaum how he became frustrated and did not know what to do when interpreting a pictograph of an airplane and decided to take flight and move to a different section of the score and search for new inspiration. Applebaum describes the performer's choice as a perfectly appropriate interpretation of my piece. My methodology for phenomenological analysis operates on two levels. The first level begins with a conversation with performers post-performance to better understand how the music they created corresponds with the scores. This process, as mentioned, clarifies the intuitiveness or semantic soundness of the graphic notation by looking to the perceptive and affective non-sonorous phenomenological experiences of the individual. This method assumes the phenomenological attitude by claiming the empirical reality of the subjective experience. The second level is to create a graphical analysis using Thorson's oral sonology system. Because Thorson's method has the capacity to create a coherent analysis for music which, for which the relationship between score and recorded performance is ambiguous and complex, the system is ideal for analyzing recordings of open graphic score interpretations. I will use my piece Open Graphic Score number 3 from my Open Graphic Score research project to illustrate my method of phenomenological music analysis. This score was chosen because, although it can produce incredibly complex and ambiguous interpretations, it has also produced multiple interpretations that share a distinct sonic identity, making it ideal for the purposes of this paper.
In his interpretation, Stillabauer favors a wayfinding approach by reading the score left to right. After his performance, he said, I think that one was the most obvious what I chose to do, referring to the overt form that moves through the circles that are small and solid to circles that are large and fractured when reading the score left to right. He states that my breaths got longer and longer as the balls went from small to big and more amplitude until the last one was a big scream. Reading the score left to right illustrates Stillabauer's life world as a prerequisite for phenomenological experiences, in that he connects reading his, this graphic score to his experiences reading traditional Western notation. In this recording session, Stillabauer stated he had never done anything like this before, referring to the interpretation of open graphic scores. And this illustrates a type of bracketing where he was able to investigate the phenomena, the scores, as it appeared in his consciousness. This is the second level of analysis that utilizes Lasse Thorsen's aural synology system. This is a spectromorphological analysis of Stillabauer's performance. In the first 30 seconds of the interpretation, Stillabauer constricts his throat and plays with breath to create extremely quiet, vacillating, complex, unpitched sounds. This is represented by the three square glyph. Uh, that's seven seconds there. Um, a vacillating sound is one whose energy articulations are unpredictable and diverse. Thorson presents the creaking of a door, the cracking of the tone produced by a badly handled bow on a string instrument as examples of vacillating sounds. At a quiet volume, Stillabauer's vocal sounds produce a small amount of coarseness slash granularity, which is indicated by the four humped figure above the continuation line there between seven and eight seconds. The first 30 seconds of the performance correspond to roughly the first 10 to 13 solid black circles in the score that begin on the high left side of the page. From 35 to 48 seconds, Stillabauer's voice becomes a more diastonic sound, which is a blend of pitched and unpitched elements, which we can see uh, beginning at 35 seconds there with the circle diamond square glyph. Uh, this is due to the changes in vocal technique as well as the use of ladder dynamics. The move to ladder dynamics also creates a moderate medium degree of coarseness granularity indicated by the zigzag figure at 36 seconds, a large middle deviation in the pitch gate, and a lar which is the uh, three diamonds there, and a large middle deviation in the dynamic gate, which is the squiggle there at 38 seconds. The pitch gate and dynamic gate glyphs act as shorthands for the analysis because the musical elements, dynamic and pitch, are in constant unpredictable flux. At 49 seconds, the vocal sounds continue to grow in amplitude and the pitch gate becomes faster, as we can see with the uh, four smaller diamonds there. Um, and this is because Stillabauer forces more air through his constricted throat. At 108, there is an increase in coarseness and granularity, while the dynamic gate and the pitch gate remain the same until the end of the performance. At 123, we see and hear the same gesture and an increase in, in dynamics. And at 139, the final vocal gesture begins. At 150, we have the loudest moment, the climax of the piece, which corresponds to the largest circle.
In performance, Ellis interprets the circles on his guitar and the connecting squiggles are his voice. Ellis too favors a wayfinding approach, but also, fa but also makes more explicit use of his affective emotional responses to the score. Ellis reads the score left to right, producing an almost identical dynamic form to Stilla Bowers, where the piece begins very quietly and gradually grows. Reading the score left to right again illustrates the life world as a prerequisite for phenomenological experiences by connecting to his experiences reading traditional Western notation. However, instead of the, l the final larger circle being the loudest and most aggressive, as it is in Stillabauer's interpretation, Ellis offers a more affective interpretation and states that to him, quote, the last circle felt very peaceful, thus informing the harmonic material. As we can see in Ellis's spectromorphological analysis, the circles represent pitch sounds. The brackets that precede them indicate no onset, as sound is heard immediately once Ellis plays the guitar. The squares in between the circles represent the unpitched sound of his voice, while the uh, contours are my own addition. At 26 seconds, the individual pitches become chords, and this is indicated by the stacked pitch sounds. The lines at 38 seconds and 45 seconds indicate repeated attacks on the same chord. At 48 seconds, the guitar articulations become a fast tremolo. This is indicated by a pitched accumulation glyph, which connotes unpredictably diversified iterations. Thorson gives raindrops on a tin roof or the sound of a flock of sparrows as examples of accumulated sounds. From this point, the spectral morphology of the gestures do not change besides in their increase in amplitude until the final circle, which begins at 151. As mentioned, Ellis effectively interprets the final circle as something peaceful and common, which is indicated by a change in harmony, articulations, and amplitude. The final chord becomes a more consonant arpeggiated gesture that begins niente and gradually builds to a mezzo forte before a quick decrescendo and the ending of the interpretation. Ellis's explanation renders his perceptive and affective phenomenological non-sonorous experiences sonorous. By drawing on his affective emotional experiences when interpreting the score, Ellis illustrates a quality of interpretation that is unique to graphic scores. Identity through form. We can clearly see how both of these forms uh, have a similar resemblance. They both begin very quietly and have a climax around the two minute mark, which is marked by a goal attainment glyph, the circle triangle there. And these gestures are called forward oriented gestures. Um, within Stillabauer's dynamic form, his macro dynamic form, we can see seven static gestures. Uh, and they're static because they're not being directed towards a future point in time. Whereas the final gesture isn't static because there's that increase from in amplitude from mezzo forte to double forte. And Ellis's dynamic form is very similar. The main difference is that um, at two minutes, the macro form becomes a static gesture as well. It flattens out and then descends, decrescendos, and becomes a uh, backward-oriented gesture. And this is called a fully differentiated dynamic form. Um, Ellis's dynamic form analysis also has more individual gestures because, as mentioned, his wayfinding approach follows the score in a more one-to-one -one manner. In conclusion, this presentation has shown how discussing performers' preceptive and affective phenomenological experiences when interpreting and performing graphic scores and developing a corresponding visual analysis can illustrate one possible methodology for analyzing open graphic scores. These two interpretations illustrate that it is possible for complex open graphic scores to retain a distinct and similar aural identity and or dynamic form over subsequent performances. This, uh, the example analyzed, open graphic score number three, also illustrates an example of what Rob Casey calls phenomenological notation, which is something I hope to explore more in the future. And Casey states that graphic scores strive to become an object in the world that is phenomenally experienced by the performer, taking its place in the expanded web of worldly things, the instrument, the room, the audience, the sights and sounds in which the performer is situated. Thank you very much.